Just a quick about us. I mentioned I'm from Radiant Earth. Um, so we're an incubator for different data-driven initiatives. Um, we very much believe in this like gazelle concept of any small different organizations scrappily working on important things and helping each other in that sense. Um, and so two of our smaller initiatives that are parts of this bigger ecosystem of the geospatial realm is Cloud Native Geospatial Foundation and then Source Cooperative, which Kevin had mentioned. Cloud Native Geospatial Foundation, so that's what we're doing here today, um, aimed to increase adoption of highly efficient approaches to working with geospatial data on the internet. So GeoPairK is one of those mechanisms and work like this today of like educating and also just fueling work around that is basically our um, mission with the Cloud Native Geospatial Foundation. And then Source Cooperative um, is our data publishing utility for easy, easy sharing of data over the web. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that much today, but it's just, um, it works really well with these cloud native formats of how do we just share data more efficiently and the like actual doing of it. So a lot of you seem like you have knowledge in this, but I will just go over this um, very generally so that we're kind of all on the same page. What does cloud optimize mean? So basically, data these days are more like intended to be read instead of just stored. So the idea of it's going to be read more and like how can we make data more efficient to be read. So how to do that would be partial reads, parallel reads, and then file metadata. Um, the analogy I like, so we're recording this right now and if you're watching this video back on YouTube in a few weeks and you just wanted to watch my talk, so you wouldn't have to download eight hours of information before even viewing the video. You could say, I just want to skip, like on YouTube does this, I just want to skip to minute 15 and start and watch for 15 minutes. So that's the idea of partial reads. Parallel reads for the efficient, like your computer can efficiently do that. Um, and then file metadata and one read. So cloud optimized data often has uh, metadata with it describing where you can find the data within the um, file. And so if, yeah, that's how YouTube would say like, hey, this is where in this storage Michelle's talk is. In addition to just efficiently reading the data, um, cloud implementation can also include reading data over the web easier. So these days, uh, data is more often read over the internet than in like floppy disks or things like in the past. So being able to use HTTP RAID requests to easily download that data from the web, um, and then supporting lazy access uh, and intelligent subsetting. So an example of intelligent subsetting would be just spatial subsetting, like there's a data set that's of all the United States and you just want San Francisco. So that would be an example of something that cloud optimized can do efficiently. Um, and then integrating with other um, analysis libraries. So there's a lot of work that's been done around a lot of these cloud um, optimized formats. Um, and so there's many tools that can make this work even more efficient. Um, there's a lot of text on here, but basically the idea, or like the overarching idea of why you want to cloud optimize your data is less downloads. So that's great for the producers or the providers and the users. Uh, less downloads for a provider means reduced cost, re reduced server load, um, less storage if it's a compressed <laughs> file. Um, and yeah, like co-locating co -locating compute with the data is all benefit to the provider. And then for a user, less downloading means less time waiting for data, less tossing out irrelevant data if you're masking. You did have to download an entire Linux that scene, but you only wanted like a very small part of it. Um, and yeah, like less downloading data into memory or to your computer, less dealing with many random files. Uh, it's just better in that sense. So you're not getting data that you don't actually want and you know from the get-go that you don't want. Um, and cloud optimizing your data also opens up many opportunities um, for like serverless computing. Dynamic tiling is 
possible because of cloud cloud optimized data. Um, we have cloud computing, so doing the compute in the cloud instead of having to do it on a local computer, um, and many more things to come. So this slide is just kind of showing an overview of what cloud optimized data looks like. So this is an example with um, a cloud optimized GeoTIFF, but the takeaway is more those three general areas. So having read oriented file structure, pre-rendered overviews or indexes, and then just reading what you need. So with the cog, there's um, the file, like the metadata allows us to know where things are located. Um, the pre-rendered overviews or indexes, so you can look, <coughs> when you're looking at the data, um, there's these overview components. So instead of downloading every bit and every pixel of the data for this, for cog, you can, they have, created these overviews so you can look at the whole world and it's not getting every single data so that's or every single pixel downloaded there's just like a overview tiles of information um, which is good for visualization when you're trying to figure out what data you want and then the component that I've kind of talked about already but that's just like the big points I like to really hammer it in is reading just what you need so um, being able if there's if the blue four tiles on the, that far right image, if those are four different scenes, like let's say Landsat scenes, instead of having to download all four scenes, you could download, if you're just wanting what's in the red box, the subtiles within there of the data that you actually need. Um, so you're not wasting time and storage on data that you already know you're not gonna use. Um, so sounds great, I'm in, right? But there are the challenges and why there are many people that are not doing cloud optimized yet or barriers to making this happen. Um, so there's already many existing geospatial data formats that have their establishment in governments, in workflows and companies. Um, and then the type of data, there's different type of data, so points, lines, polygons, raster. These are, it's not just like a one size fit all for what type of data um, or format is going to be good for the data. Um, user dependent, kind of what I mentioned earlier, of like, yeah, different organizations are already in their systems and might not be ready to completely shift everything over. And there's also new tools um, to deal with that different data. This table is kind of that idea of there's no one size fits all for packaging data. Um, on the left here, we see there's a small fry from the back, but we have many different types of data. So, like imagery, swath, trajectory, point cloud, it keeps going down, vectors. And then on um, the top, you see the types of data formats that are appropriate for that data. And they did a test to try it out out and so different data is going to work better with different storage formats. Um, so you can't just be like put everything in ZAR, um, even though some people might <laughs> think that's a good idea, but it's often better to have different types of formats depending on the data you have to utilize it the best. Um, so there are many other formats out there too, but these are just the ones that are most prominent out there right now for cloud optimized data formats. Um, and I'm just gonna talk really briefly over each of them. Um, so the, we got the format on the left and then the data type on the right. So the cloud optimized GeoTIFF is great for raster data types. Um, the ZAR and Kerchunk are great for multi-dimensional rasters. Um, cloud optimized point cloud or Copic and then also entwined point tiles are good for point cloud data, so like LIDAR. Um, and then for vector, we've got flat geobuff and geoparquet, which is why we're all here today. Um, and so taking that table and then looking at the archival format that replaces and then also like their status of where they're at in adoption and if they have some sort of standard status. So a lot of these either are on their way to having a standard status or already do. They're very established um, data formats. Um, and so 
that's great. And then for what each of these kind of replaces, the cloud optimized GeoTIFF replaces just the standard GeoTIFF. Zara and Kerchunk replace Net, um, HDF5 and NetCDF. Cloud optimized point clouds um, are, are a replacement for like LAS files. And then the vector flat geo buffer geo parquet is for shape files, geo package, geo JSON. Uh, so I'm just going to do a quick overview of each of these. Um, so raster, the cloud optimized GeoTIFF. Um, so this is uh, like a great example is Landsat on AWS is stored in COGS. And so if we look at this photo, and that was a Landsat scene, instead of having to download the entire scene, you could say, I just want this one area. And COGS are stored in small tiles within that scene instead of just um, like lines of data or that entire scene. And so that's the idea behind COGS. Um, so it has that internal tiling and then that overviews that I mentioned earlier of if someone's just looking at it beforehand, um, the tiling of um, the overviews of just like being able to view it without having to view all the granularity of the data. And then we saw this um, image earlier, it's a bit bigger now, but just having that um, internal file directories, IFDs of, hey, these are these different chunks. We've got the raw data and then we have the multiple, multiple levels of overviews. Um, and with COGS, there's um, HTTP get range requests to be able to access that data over the web. Um, so if you have raster data um, or multi, like data that's not just the coordinates or a spatial area of it, but same thing like a climate model that's going to have more information associated with that data, like temperature or pressure um, in addition with the spatial information, something a multi-dimensional raster, so something like ZAR would be great for that. Um, so that concept of data cubes, so there's not just the X and Y, but there's also um, more information there that you want to store. And so ZAR are chunked, compressed, and dimensional arrays. Um, and then there's outside of the ZAR, there's um, a metadata file telling you where different data is stored um, so you can efficiently find it and download just what you need. Kerchunk, it kind of goes hand in hand with ZAR. So if you have an archival format like NetSkidiff or HDF5 and you don't have the luxury of creating the data from scratch or reformatting the data in a completely new format, Kerchunk is a really cool tool that creates that ZAR metadata file that lives outside of the ZAR um, for an archival format so, so that you can read the archival format as if it was ZAR. So you can use all the tools around ZAR because you have this external metadata file that Kerchunk created for your um, archival formats. So this is really great, especially for um, different governmental data that will always be in NetCDF or HDF5 that they're unable to like just completely transform what type of data they're going to use. Um, and being able to read that and utilize all the tool and the ecosystem around ZAR. Um, topic or cloud optimized point clouds um, is, I'm not going to dive too deep into it, but it's, based, it's the cloud optimized version um, data format for uh, point clouds. So if you have something like LiDAR and you want to efficiently store it, cloud optimized point clouds is something to look into. Um, and then a few slides at the end here, I'll have a link to our um, guide that's on cloudinterview.com and then it has, or .org, and it has more information about all of these if that's something that catches your eye and you're interested in it. So today, the reason we're here today um, is GeoParquet. Um, so GeoParquet is great for vector data. Um, it's all based around Parquet standards, and so, but you're just adding in the Geo component. Um, and Parquet is focused on columnar data instead of reading as rows, reads as columns for efficient, um, like 
compression and reading. Um, and the one thing, and I'm ha I'll have Chris talk on this a little bit more, but there's no, currently no spatial indexing for GeoParque. Um, there's some in development, and I'll, I'll let Chris, if you have more questions than that, Chris knows a better answer to that. But that's something to keep in mind. If today you're like, I need spatial indexing for my vector data, flat geo buff does have that. Um, and so that's another option for vector data. But today we're talking about GeoPark. So this is that guide I mentioned. Um, if you go to guide.cloudnativegeo.org or you scan this QR code, this is a great guide of just intro um, information to these cloud native formats. There's a few more on there that I didn't have time to mention today. Um, and then additional resources link out from there. So if any of those are like, I really want to dive into Zara more, this is a great place to start. Um, and it was developed by Development Seed for Impact, um, and it's hosted on Cloud Native Geospatial. Um, and I just had this in here, just a little overview of what we do at Cloud Native Geospatial Foundation. So development sprints, holding the space, like this is what we're doing today. Um, we held the stack sprint last September, um, today's event. And then next week we're doing the czar sprint. So I mentioned czar to you today in New York City. So you happen to be in New York City next week. That is happening. Um, we might have some, we're going to have some virtual breakouts too if, um, that are more pointed on some development. We also have like paid fellowships to, um, kind of keep on these things. So Brandon Liu is an example of that, and he does um, PM tiles. Um, and yeah, so we also yeah, provide education like that uh, guide, and then webinars for the general public um, or organizations like the Kenya Space Agency that are in need of learning a bit more about this stuff. So that's who we are. Um, that's the end of my talk.